It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Tuesday, April 19th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is wondering, like, what is the right thing to do to cleanse ourselves of this season? I feel like we should go and take our trip to the Dead Sea and float in the Dead Sea. That sounds like a really good option. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, once again, I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at our Miriam. I'm here with my amazing co-host, Russ Cohen, who's on Twitter at Sportsology. Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. You can follow us on Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You'll keep up to date on all the Flyers news and our episodes. You can also email the show at LockedOnFlyers at gmail.com. We are doing a mailbag this week, so get in your questions about what you're looking for this offseason, what you're looking for at the draft, any potential prospects you want us to cover, and we will happily get to them on the show. On today's program, we are going to get caught up with the latest with the Flyers, preview tonight's matchup against the Toronto Maple Leafs. And then we are going to have our Phantoms Tuesday, which is always a good time checking in on the kids in Lehigh Valley. Lockdown Flyers is free and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you are listening. So subscribe. You'll get all of our episodes here on the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, Russ. So there was some interesting news yesterday uh, that came via Crossing Broad about a lawsuit filed from Flyers trainers Jim McCrossin, longtime uh, Flyers trainer, and also uh, his colleague Sal Rafa, who have very sadly developed some chronic illnesses and they allege that they are due to some uh, chemicals at the Voorhees practice facility. And as of now, the Flyers uh, disagree with the assessment put forth in this lawsuit and say because of legal proceedings, we cannot comment further at this time. Um, I think, you know, Obviously, it's early days in this story, so mm -hmm. I think we will get additional information as it progresses. But I think just first and foremost, we want to just send our appreciation and best wishes to both Jim and Sal, who, again, have been stalwarts uh, on this team in terms of the training staff and just familiar faces around the rink. And, and that is our, our primary concern, but also that, you know, again, early days just want to make sure that, you know, we get the full story moving forward uh, before we make any value judgments. Right. Uh, right now I just feel nothing but sadness and I do just want to know more. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, our hearts go out to both Jim and Sal and, and their families. The Flyers themselves on the ice did not practice yesterday. So again, not much uh, information in terms of any potential changes that we might see against the Leafs tonight. Uh, we did see those very same Toronto Maple Leafs recently on April 2nd. In fact, uh, the Flyers lost to the Leafs 6-3. to And in that game, the thing that I remember the most is that the Flyers actually hung in with the Leafs for a significant part of the game and then just fell apart entirely. And, you know, the guys that make the Leafs, the Leafs kind of took over the game. It wasn't unexpected, but at the same time, given how they hung in there for a decent amount of the game, it was just disappointing. Yeah, it, I don't think right now the Leafs are playing even better hockey. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the Flyers are going to hang with them for more than a period, to be honest. Uh, Austin Matthews is on a tear. Well, he's wanting, he's looking for 60 now. So he, you know, he's, if he's playing, cause I know they, they sat him recently, but it's probably a load management thing. And they've been doing that. That's the only friend to the Flyers here is that some players won't be playing due to load management. 
They won't yeah. announce it as load management, but you know. Well, you know, apparently he's slightly banged up, and so they kept him out, you know, for precautionary reasons. Um, he may or may not be back tonight. We don't know yet as of recording. But, you know, you're right. He's been on a tear. He's fifth overall in the league. In he scoring. gets 60 goals at home. That's a that's a big motivating thing for him to get in that game, isn't it? Yeah, he's leading the NHL in goals right now with 58. So against the Flyers, scoring two is doesn't seem like a difficult <laughs> task. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Yeah. So, you know, I think that between that and, you know, the Leafs overall um, – have 50 wins which is the most wins they've ever had as a franchise and which is hard to believe Mm -hmm. but again wins in this era come differently right you you get shootout wins you get these overtime wins instead of ties so i think you have to take that a little bit with a grain of salt but i I will tell you since the addition of giordano it has solidified their blue line to some degree they still have a lot of looseness in it don't get me wrong Uh, and their penalty kill is much better than I think it was months ago, too. So, you know, those two things with the Leafs, guys like Mikhaev, who's been really great all year as an additional scorer. Um, you know, Nylander seems to always do well against the Flyers. Ever since the Flyers really had interest in him a few seasons ago, maybe trying to acquire him before he signed that contract, he's he seems to always be on a tear, too. So this is a situation where you can't leave the goalie hung out to dry like you did with Sandstrom, like, yes, against the Sabres in the second game. You cannot do that. The Leafs will just eat you up, eat you alive if you do that. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, while the Leafs are solidly in the playoffs, you know, they've they've been there for a while, they are currently fighting for home mice advantage. And, you know, they're six points ahead of Tampa, nine points ahead of Boston in their division. They've got six games left. This is one of their, uh, I think, only two remaining games that are at home for them. They go on a road trip after the game against the Flyers. So I think that this is a game that is very crucial for them in terms of getting home ice advantage. So it's not going to be one of those things where they're just coasting through till the end of the season. No, and that's why Matthews will be in there. I I will be completely shocked if he's not in there. Yeah. I think, you know, the other guy for me to pay attention to more closely is Mitch Marner. And, you know, he has 34 goals this season. And, you know, in the last 40 games, he's scored 26 goals. Um, this is a career best season for him. And I think, you know, especially recently, he's been th- absolutely thriving out there. And, and with that one, two punch that they have, well, I guess it's really, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, Bunting's, punch, maybe, I mean, Bunting's had this team. amazing, yeah, yeah, Bunting's got 60 points, which yeah. is way more than I thought he would get this year. I thought he'd get like 40, 45. So it's been incredible. The thing with Marner is, what used to hurt them was teams would just back off him and instead of shooting, he'd pass and that would give them Mm -hmm. sort of an advantage. Now he might shoot if you back off him. Really all you can do is set up a perimeter about around Marner because you can't put too much emphasis on him, but you have to look where Marner is and also look where Matthews is at the same time. Even if that means leaving bunting alone at times, that's probably what you have to do. Yeah, I mean, obviously, well, again, we'll see if Matthews is in the lineup and that could adjust, you know, what the could. the Leafs lines look like. But, you know, at the same time, they have such depth up front and such strong firepower, regardless of who's out there on the first two lines, that it's tough. And I think especially with, you know, Zamula and Ronnie Adderd out there, you know, as younger, greener defensemen for the Flyers, I think, you know, Sandheim and Provi are going to have to really raise their game. Oh, yeah, they've got their work cut out. So it, it'll be a challenge. Plus, Jack Campbell, I think, is playing better again. I think he had a yeah. rough patch, but I think he's gotten his way out of it, um, especially in that last game against the Islanders um, that they played, which eliminated the Islanders officially. Uh, from the playoffs but 
yeah, I think that that was kind of the big concern for me, at least, you know, when we played them the first time was their goaltending. But I think Campbell has kind of gotten his game back. He has. And, and really with Campbell, it's mostly mental. Uh, he's, he's got all the physical tools to ever want in a goalie. Uh, and when he's mentally right, that's that's when Jack Campbell could be really dangerous. And I do think he uh, he probably has turned the corner. We'll see what he'll look like in the playoffs. But for now, you know, he's he's definitely a worthy adversary. Well, we are going to head up the highway a little bit to Lehigh Valley coming up next. But first, we are going to talk about our friends at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports development, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Now podcast. It's nightly recaps of every NHL game with analysis from all of our local experts. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Russ, it's always something with the Phantoms in terms of injuries and call-ups and guys being sent down. And this week was no different. Uh, Obviously, we know from what's been going on with the Flyers, Felix Sandstrom has been going back and forth between the two teams relative to the schedules because of the Carter Hart injury. But he did play one game for the Phantoms on Friday this week. Uh, Tanner Lozinski came back down and played on Friday. We know Agar Zamula stayed up with the Flyers because of the Cam York injury. Uh, Hayden Hodgson had been hurt in a Flyers game and is likely out for the rest of the season regardless. That's too bad. Yeah, I mean, obviously to be determined, but uh, that's what they're saying as of now. And uh, Isaac Radcliffe uh, got banged up and sat during the third period in Wednesday's Phantoms game was out Friday, but then he did come back Saturday. So that was good to see. And then Linus Hogberg was back for his first game since March 18th. He played on Saturday for the Phantoms as well. Those are kind of the key guys we've been keeping track of in terms of what their gameplay has looked like. Again, you know, we talked about it. I think yesterday it was like, is the candle out on the Phantom season? I think it is. It's not official, but it really is given the results from this past week. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about last Monday's game on last week's Phantoms update, but you know, looking at the last four games that they've played since we talked about this team last, we got uh, almost every kind of result <laughs> that you could possibly <laughs> get. We had a straight up regulation loss, a regulation win. We had an overtime loss and, and a shootout loss. So uh, clearly, you know, getting a point or two to keep it technically alive, but not enough to really sol- solidify a playoff position, which is pretty much par for the course. I think this team for this team all season long. Yeah. The, you know, I was talking to a, a Lehigh Valley writer who was covering the Flyers recently. And I, the feeling is, is that the defense has just been awful. It's been awful for a little while now. Remember like early in the year, we were like, you know, liking what we saw out of Clendenning. Well, that's mm-hmm. completely changed. And so maybe he won't even get signed next year now as a result. Uh, there's there's issues on the blue line. There's issues with, with the special teams. Maybe the penalty kills slightly better, but – the team's just a mess and you can't blame it all on just call-ups because every team in the American hockey league goes through this every single team. So really Ian LaPerrier is going to have, uh, you know, a hell of an end of the year exit to talk about all this. And part of it is his fault. And part of it is the organization's fault for not giving him enough support. 
Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's a, a fair assessment that, you know, he may end up not returning next year, but it won't be entirely of his doing. No. Uh, but again, I think he, we've been talking about this. He's running into some similar problems as Mike Yo, where he's saying the right things and he seems to know what's wrong. But yet, for whatever reason, they can't motivate these particular players into doing those things to fix it. Right. And if you can't so, do that... Yeah. I mean, that that's ball game. You yeah. Know. I, I think this week, the thing that stood out to me the most is that, especially because they knew that their playoff position was at stake. And so they were taking more shots and they were getting more shots on goal and holding opponents to fewer shots. And, you know, I would say they played pretty well in three out of the four games this week, but ultimately they just weren't scoring enough. And so if you look at last Monday's game, they were up in shots 31 to 22, Wednesday's game 38 to 22, Friday's game 36 to 21. Uh, and, you know, the Phantoms had a season high 21 shots in the second period on Friday, but then only got five shots in the third period. You know, and then the one game on Saturday where they were down in shots, it was 31 to 30. So again, you know, keeping opposing teams to 21, 22 shots is good. Getting above 35 shots in a game is good. But you got to get these goals in, right? Yeah, I mean, quality of shots is, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. The American Hockey League is a very good league. The goaltending in the league is much better than it was last year because last year they had the taxi squad. So, yeah, just leading in shots on goal isn't enough. Yeah, I think that's just been the problem is that – they have a, a lot of, again, similar problems to the Flyers where they're too static at times. They're making bad choices. They're taking those shots, but they're from bad angles or, you know, too far out. Like they'll take the shot too early. I think, I think Wade Allison is maybe the only guy that doesn't take shots too early mm -hmm. all the time. I think he actually makes some really good choices there. But I, I think that they've just had these problems continuously and that leads to uh, being down a, a goal. I mean, you look at all of these scores from this past week, they're one goal games. So, yep. you know, the ones that they did not win, all of them were in theory winnable games. I mean, obviously two of the games went into overtime, um, one of them leading to a shootout. So they were in those games and ultimately did not come out on the other end with the win. And that's not going to get you anywhere. No, in the in the end, you've got to, it's a results driven business, and they're not pulling that end. And so now, you have to start the same way you are evaluating the Flyers. There has to be an evaluation of what's there too, because you have to now decide what veterans that are on the team you're going to bring back, and what veterans you're going to target to help your next gen players. And someone like Millman will obviously be up there all next year. So you have to look at all those things and how they fit in. Exactly. Plus and some I, of the flyers that are playing right now that will play with the Phantoms at the start of next year, too. They're not all making the flyers. No, that is absolutely true. I think one guy that stood out in a really positive way this past week was Maxim Sushko, mm -hmm. where he had a goal in three out of the four games over the past week or so, and his game has gotten stronger, I think, from what it was earlier i know he's been out in and out of the lineup but you know i think he's finally kind of getting back to his game and um especially i think he was rushing the net a little bit more which was good to see you know especially um in the game against hershey uh he scored the go-ahead goal and it was like a dirty goal up front where like even the net was dislodged and they initially called it no goal but it was in but i think that you know that is a good sign and something positive for him individually no matter what the flyers decide to do with him moving forward but also i think you know shows that he's going to compete and he's going to battle coming into next season yeah, and he does have some skill in his game, too. I feel like there's no question in my mind he's an AHL talent and still could be like a fringe NHL or, you know, an occasional call-up depth guy down the line if he stays healthy because he has the desire to be really good. Like, that's the one thing he's had through his whole career so far is he's always gotten better. 
He's always had good finishes to seasons. So I just feel like, you know, he's he's close to putting it all together that way. Yeah, and I think that, you know, for for guys like him who are borderline, and you've always seen like little flashes of this potential, but really could be solid AHL players. If he got one really solid season under his belt with the Phantoms, I think that that could go a long way and maybe give him another shot at the NHL. I just think that Mm -hmm. the Phantoms have to be in a better position to support him which is what we're worried about systemically Mm -hmm. with this team. Yeah, because, again, we don't know who the Flyers coach will be next year. And honestly, do we know who the Phantoms coach is going to be? Not yet. So I don't know how any of this is going to fit in. And I would have to say, as soon as the season ends, they have to start putting some of these things into place or at least have a plan and that's that could take, you know, months. I mean, you still could be waiting two months if you're waiting for a coach who's potentially going deep into the Stanley Cup if it's an assistant or somebody or waiting to see if someone gets fired if they don't make the playoffs. Like, you know, that's where you have to hope that there's a great strategy behind the scenes, and I don't know if there is. We're going to talk more about that exact point and some more of the action from the Phantoms this past week coming up next. But first, this episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning while the person behind the counter orders the parts in their computer, they're going to choose the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have your computer with access to rockauto.com at home and on your phone in your pocket. Rock Auto's prices are reliably low for every customer from expert mechanics to bid to beginner do-it-yourselfers. They have everything you need from brake parts, tail lamps, mortar oil, to even new carpet. Whatever you need for your car, you're going to be able to find it and get your car in shape. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. All right, Russ. So continuing our conversation on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, I think that it's so hard to evaluate some of these players individually based on some of these systemic problems that we've been talking about with this team. So when a player can kind of break through that and show that they deserve the call-ups, like Lazinski getting that emergency right. call-up. I think, you know, he's been playing really well overall. And I think that, you know, we talked last week about wanting sort of a highlighting line of Ratcliffe, Lazinski, and Allison to see how they play together, again, for future Flyers potential, mm-hmm. but also to see if they could excel. And we almost got that on Saturday in Providence where Lazinski and Allison were on a line together, but Ratcliffe was uh, on the line with Strom and Willman. And honestly, like Strom and and Ratcliffe have played well together over the course of the season. So I get it. Like, I understand why they did that, but I really just want that. Like, give me that line in, (laughs) just give me that line. Yeah. You see, again, you're not allowed to have two wants. No. It's one or the other. I know. I know. Um, I think the uh, the thing about that game in Providence is that um, Wade Allison tried to do a lacrosse style goal <laughs> uh, that did not work. Um, goaltender interference was called because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't quite. Of course, he, of course, he got right. goaltender interference. I mean, they disagreed in, with the call, obviously, but sure. I, I think you know, it was it was kind of borderline there. But then, you know, you look at the other side of the coin with that game where they only got um, four shots on goal in the overtime of that game. Be- they were on the power play and, and only got four shots on goal in total in wow. that overtime. And when you're playing four on three, you should just be firing on all cil- cylinders at that point. Yeah, no question. I mean, you have to do better than that. You have to, um, 
at least set up better. And even if you're not taking, even if you're taking the shots from the point, at least you're getting shots off. The, again, not getting enough shots off on the power play is a systemic problem with the Flyers. It happens throughout their whole organization. And so, you know, these are things that I really hope that when they have meetings, the Flyers, that they bring it up for both and understand that you had two you have two different coaches, but yet Le Perrier was at the NHL level and now he's carried over some of those bad tendencies from the NHL team to the AHL team. So now what? Yeah, and you know, another similar problem they have is not being able to play the full sixty minutes of yes. the game, where again, using Saturday's game against Providence as an example. You know, they struggled, I think, early in that game, and they definitely had a better third period than the first two. And, you know, Wade Allison uh, scored, actually, in that third period. It was a nice goal, but he wouldn't have had that kind of time in an NHL game, let me tell you, <laughs> like before yeah. he got that shot up. Yeah, um, you know, again, we're not saying the players aren't culpable, too, but and I don't want to say they were almost set up to fail the players with the Phantoms, but they definitely did not have the best situation this year down there to have success. I will put it that way. Yeah. And I think your point about looking at the program and the organization holistically is what's really important here. Because again, you know, we've been saying week in and week out with the Phantoms that they have some similar problems to the Flyers. So that yes. says a lot. So when they're looking to build a coaching staff, a player development team moving forward, they have to look at this as one giant organization and make sure that they're putting their AHL level players who have two way contracts in a position that any one of them can be called up and fit right in and be successful. Right. And, and we are absolutely not there yet. No. And, and, and the thing you have to look at with that is so like going into camp next year, you have to have a very good handle on what's going on with all of that because yeah. camp has to be on the same page before they get to Lehigh while they're all together. And then they eventually split apart. You've got to have that one message. Right. And they have to have that ready for development camp. Yes. So that I know development camp is supposed to be sort of non evaluating and it, you know, it's about taking steps forward and for, you know, the new draftees and, and whatnot to kind of get used to the NHL environment. But at the same time, they need to instill whatever values this organization wants to profess for next year, starting at development camp and then going into training camp uh, later in, in the year. You know, the X factor here, you know, Mike O'Connell was brought on. We saw him a lot in camp as a senior advisor to the GM and player development. Well, maybe he needs to get more involved uh, in day-to-day, -day, and maybe they need to try and bring him on day-to-day. -day. Maybe that will help, because Michael Connell knows hockey. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good idea. Well, and maybe sharing more information about what he's working on with us. Yep. You know, I think that would be helpful as well, because I think, you know, we feel and when I say we, I mean, sort of the fan base and and what we read in, in the media. We don't have a sense of what's going on behind the scenes there no. to build confidence. And I think that's something that's going to be important. We hear things um, in camp and I go mm -hmm. all the time to camp and I'm there, you know, three out of five days, whatever it is. And I hear the messages and, you know, I don't think that message that was happening in camp carried through. And so that needs to be worked on. Well, the Phantoms have three games this week to maybe start working on some of those things, uh, or at least hopefully do so. They're playing tonight at Providence, and then they've got games Friday and Saturday against Hershey at home. So I think... You know, again, I want to see combinations of our top prospects out there to see what they can do and see where they might fit in uh, going into the offseason. Maybe we need to do a Reading Royals update because they are in the playoffs. They are. They are. We, we will talk about them coming up as the playoffs start for the ECHL. 
All right, wrapping up with our Flyers fun thing. Uh, Sean Couturier, who we don't talk about very much, again, because he's out for the season, yeah. uh, got his number retired from his junior team. And uh, that's always good to see when, when that happens. I've been to a few of those nights. I was at one for, for Patrick Kane with the London Knights like two years ago. Uh, I, it's fun to be at those nights. It's fun to see it happen. I was at the draft for Couturier, and it was interesting because I was in the stands, and they were getting ready to have us interview players, and Couturier was one of the players down on the floor. It was only about six or seven. This is like pre-pre-draft stuff. And that trade went through, and Steve Wino was the one who told me, and all of a sudden I had this whole different set of questions and who I was going to talk to and what I was going to talk to him about you know, on that floor. And, you know, the Couturier, when, when he was in junior hockey, was definitely um, a high point guy, right? A high mm-hmm. total guy. But then when he and came in the And that, of course, NH- was at Drummondville in the Q. Yes, at Drummondville of the Q. And then when they brought him into the NHL, Laviolette puts him in that defensive role. And I think that sort of did change his career arc a little bit. He was able to become more offensive over the years, but he has become that selkie kind of center. So I think he's traded some of his offensive ability for that. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I'm just saying that's what happens sometimes with players. Like you have to, you know, fill the needs of an organization. Yeah. And he's just been, I think a real asset to the flyers in that way. And, you know, famously facing off against, you know, top guys, especially in the Flyers Pens rivalry, you know, the way that he's been able to handle Malkin and Crosby, I think has been phenomenal. So, uh, you know, again, always love to see when guys like this get appreciated uh, in ceremonies like this and getting their numbers retired. And uh, hopefully he'll come back to the Flyers uh, in good shape, ready to go next season. Yeah, and Ian LaPerrier is one of those retired numbers, too. Uh, Steve Duchesne as well. Oh, nice. That'll do it for today's show. We will be back tomorrow with a recap of tonight's game against Toronto, and we'll have our mailbag. So like I said at the top of the show, if you got questions about the Flyers going into the offseason, anything we've talked about today with the Phantoms and how that should be integrated. Oh, and Danny Briere too, sorry. Oh, <laughs> And any of the prospects that we're looking at for the draft, uh, ask away and we will answer those questions. You can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers or you can email us at LockdownFlyers at gmail.com. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R-M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. You made us your first listen today. Now make your next listen locked on fantasy hockey. Host Steel Roden and Flip Livingstone help you become the expert of your fantasy league. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great day.